Good day. Paul Sinopiat is here, Strathclyde Engraving. Hope everyone's doing okay this morning. It's uh, a little bit earlier here. Uh, time is uh, 7.32 in the morning here in sunny, muggy Louisiana. And uh, just getting ready to get my day started here so that I can continue working on the piece for my current customer which is this gorgeous Mocha May 2 with the Celtic knot design on it. Now yesterday I went in and I finished all of the edging along the lines along my you know my design elements using a 0.3 millimeter burr in the handy 700 marathon micromotor hand piece. The majority of the metal removal done in the background, in addition to the texturing, was done with a GRS 850A high-speed handpiece. So at this point, we are actually ready to start on the final process, uh, final process of the engraving. Now, yesterday, in the video that I put on the YouTube, on my YouTube channel, one of the things that we discussed was that I would be going through and uh, doing some initial sanding, which I have. I use, uh, I fold this back. I use micro mesh, which is these right here that you see. Micro mesh varies from its coarsest at 1500 grit to its finest at 12,000 grit. So. This allows me to get a real good smooth finish on the piece before I actually begin to do uh, any further engraving or any further changes in the design. Uh, there is some, I noticed last night as I was sanding, there is some pitting in the metal, which is unfortunately kind of part of the process where Mokume is concerned because we are talking about layering one layer upon another of brass and copper, sweating them together, and then rolling them out and doing what needs to be done with them. So because you're actually sweating them together, there is going to be, in some places, a minute amount of pitting. Now, uh, you know, I'm sure there were those, there's those who would argue that, well, pitting doesn't have to be there. It, it, if you're careful, it doesn't pit on and on and on. Honestly, what I have found is that regardless uh, of the work that you do, at some point pitting will set in on a soldered piece. There are, you know, there are ways to, uh, there's ways to minimize it. And I am sure that the individual who created this piece is probably very careful about that sort of thing because normally I don't see pitting in any of these Moku tubes. This isn't terribly noticeable, but... So, today's plan of action. Being that this is a wider and open design that is just really, really pretty, what I need to do is bring more attention to the design elements that are there. We do have some open areas on the piece. Needless to say, that's part of the design. Uh, that's how this that's how this knot was set up so what I want to try to do is kind of uh, go back in and do some decorative cuts on it which are basically in my in this case it's just going to be lines uh, to bring attention to the design elements and take your eyes off of the background now once we get the enameling on I think that's going to be a big part of what's actually going to be able to happen but uh, on the flip side of the coin there's also you know how you got to kind of take care of things as best as you can so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of like try a bit of an experiment this morning uh, to check and see uh, something that that I'm a little bit curious about uh, I could eyeball the lines that I'm actually going to engrave on this piece. I'm going to actually have to move my other bench light over here so I can, I can see what I'm doing. And I'm actually going to lower myself down a little bit so that I can take a closer look at this with uh, a jeweler's, uh, jeweler's hood on uh, with five power mag. Uh, I'm just going to kind of take a look at something. I want to see if there is a particular way that I can do this. 
if I can do it this way, I'm going to do it this way. If not, I'm not going to bother. Um, actually, no, I'm not going to bother. Just kind of took a look at it and not going to get the clearance that, that I want using a set of dividers to actually scribe those lines. So now it's a matter of just kind of jumping back into it and uh, going by hand and by eye. Uh, so this means I'm going to be moving very slowly today. Now, as opposed to using the 901 hand piece, which is kind of my workhorse, I've actually swapped out and I'm going to be using the Monarch. The uh, GRS Monarch is a much much smaller uh, handpiece. Uh, this one is even suitable for Bulino style engraving, which is the photorealistic engraving that you would see on like high-end shotguns and that sort of thing. Uh, it uh, has its roots, as far as I know, in Italy, and the men who do this are quite literally masters at their trade. But a lot of times, I'll find that I don't. I don't want to use a handpiece that strikes as heavy as the 901, so when that is the case, I always end up swapping back to my uh, end up swapping back to this piece, the uh, the Monarch. Now, so what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of like do our best to eyeball this as we go. And uh, the only thing that I'm really trying to do here is give myself on each of these lines an equidistant cut from the inside edge. And this cut is more of a decorative than it is anything. I hate it with it. Need to adjust my bias here. Bias is your basically the foot pedal sensitivity. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and zoom on in because I want. I want to be close to my work. Get back here. And start working my way forward. I'm, uh, I'm doing my best to keep a Kind of an equidistant line from the edge. I'm going to pick out there. I want to remove that piece. Uh, I may end up coming back with a uh, half round and doing this, but I want to get my initial line cut first before I begin to come back with any other graver. change things up. Get a little bit of a spin here. And this is, you know, just like any other part of the process, this is almost like, you know, your like your initial line work. It's going to ride right off the end like that. Okay, now we're going to roll this back. I'm going to get right here at this corner, an equidistant point from the corner. And then begin to do the same over here on the opposite side of the piece. Super. That's what we're looking for. All right, now, 
So I've got to come back around with this now. So let me, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit on this. I think what I'm going to do is actually start away from that corner. see what I'm doing. I'm going to give this a bit of a twist to get this back up towards the top where I can see it. And we will continue our line work. Now I'm using I'm using a 105 for this. Imagine the letter V and if you were to measure the angle along the top of the piece, in other words, how wide it opens up at the top, it would be 105 degrees. Yeah, I'm probably going to end up coming back with a half round on these lines. One thing that you have to be careful with on a 105 degree graver is that when you cut, if you lean the graver out or in, it produces a specific effect in your cut, what's referred to as a flare cut. And if you're not looking for that flare, then you have to maintain that graver's, I guess you could say angle, Take a look at that right quick with the naked eye. And try to decide at this point if I want to go back with a 105 degree graver. Actually, I don't think I'm going to. I'm liking the way this 105 is uh, cutting. So we're going to continue with, uh, we're going to continue with this uh, 105 from this point uh, can see I'm gonna move again you know I tend to move the same direction uh, from the start to the finish so naturally I'm gonna move this piece around to achieve that and to allow me to have better access to the areas that I'm actually cutting on uh, some places you can do it really well with some places you can't this is one of the disadvantages of of working on a curved surface on a cylinder or a tube. Excuse me, grabbing a cup of drink a cup of coffee here. It is a little early. And I enjoy honestly I enjoy getting an early start. So alright, so we're going to get an idea. of where we're actually going to start. My scope's just a tad out of focus. And I can tell real quickly because I can look at the width of that line and I'm not very happy with it. 
Also leaning the piece back towards me a little bit. I'm going to move the scope up to more towards the vertical. Get this light down a little bit so I'm not getting so much glare from that over there. And I think I've got this turned all the way up, which I do. Okay. Let me check and make sure my camera is still in the correct angle because I think I bumped it. One of the things I definitely want to make sure of is that everybody who's watching can actually see what's going on. All right, so back around. Thank you for your patience. And we're going to start cutting again. I'm going to move that one leg on my... Got so many pedals down here on the floor. So, I'm going to come back in that line. focus and off we go. This time we're going to actually, we're going to come from the end of the piece in. And the whole idea here is so that I can come off at the edge. Where I want to come off at. This is one of the portions of the engraving that can get a little nerve-wracking, especially if you're doing it freehand, like I am. Um, sometimes, if you're not watching what you're doing, your graver will get away from you. That's why you have to stay focused when you do this and maintain focus. Engraving is not something I would say I'd recommend you try if you've got a bunch of noise in your work environment or a bunch of distraction in your work environment. It's something you just want to completely step away from and avoid. Ideally, I prefer music in the background, but uh, unfortunately the music that I'd like to listen to uh, and just put in the background of my video is uh, it's not material that I own so then kind of begin to step into all of that 
copyright stuff that is important to follow because, you know, hey folks, it's not your music, it is theirs. And if you're playing it, they deserve a cut of it if you're making money. So there's another piece cut. I need to go back up here to the top half and get a, get something. But right before I do, I'm knocking out that little corner area, and I'm going to come back in and clean that up, make that look like a real nice clean corner. Super. All right, there we go. All right. Um, I believe I'm going to do the same over here. Come back and, and start doing some lining. There's a long piece that we can do, and it's pretty much right under the scope well positioned. So. I think what I'm going to do is go on ahead and take care of this one first. Uh, but before I do, I want to grab this one last little bit of line. Now remember how I started away from the edge here? This way I can come back in and just get a good solid cut right there, right off the end of the piece. That's what I want it to do. All right, so we're going to move on to our next design element and begin to work with it. Same thing, I'm not going to start at the very end. I'm going to leave myself a little bit of room to actually come back and kind of come off the edge. twist and move. Grab a focus so I can see exactly what I'm doing. Get back in my line. side, which means I'm going to have to reposition my scope and piece just a tad. Let's see where I'm at here. All right. So, and we're going to do the same thing over here on this side. We're actually going to uh, Let's start high and work back. Oof. Trust me, sometimes this isn't the first thing I want to do when I wake up in the morning. And 
this is pretty much going to be what I'm going to be doing until I come to a point to where I can actually begin to do my shading. Last time I went down a curve and didn't roll it, I didn't like the result. So we're going to swap it up. Super. Okay, come back over to the other side where I started. Finish that cut. And I'm going to come back, roll it back this way. Start back here. And grab that. Excellent. All right. So from this point on, it's just a matter of doing exactly what you have seen me doing here. It's just one piece at a time. Complete the piece get it done. So I'm going to continue to look on my piece here, see where I have been cutting, and get back over to another area that is, you know, like connected to that side, like this piece right here comes out. Start from here and work my way back. Reposition the scope again. Now, Please keep in mind that I reposition my scope in this piece out of necessity. Working on a tube is a horse of a color different from working on a flat plate like this. Completely, completely different story. This piece actually sits right here. So as you can see, when you turn this piece, flip it around, it's much easier to deal with because this surface is always going to remain flat. There's no change in the temperature on it. I don't know whether I was <laughs> nutty trying to starting off on a battery tube or was it just out of necessity? I think honestly it was out of necessity. Because this was kind of like the the first thing that I would think that anybody would end up dealing with. I could probably hand push a portion of this, but I'm A little concerned that I could like overpressure a line or overpower a line you know with the force that I've got in my right hand and in doing so on a near finished piece end up in a situation where All of a sudden, I've got a real, I've got a real issue due to a mistake I've made, and I, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't like that idea. It just didn't pop my toaster.
Super. All right. Uh, let's see. Where do I want to start from? I think I'm going to start from this corner. Another reposition of the scope. Just basically, I got to tug it straight back. some some rearranging there on my uh, my airlines okay let's see yeah getting getting that corner right right there it's not Because you have to consider that this point at the very tip here needs to be in such a place that when you bring this up, it's all going to match and look nice. Otherwise, meh. Give it up. This one, same thing. Super. There's another piece done. So I'm going to come back in. I want to nail this uh, this corner area out right quick and get it out of my way. So I'm going to start slightly away from the corner. Okay, I'm getting to a point there to where I really can't see due to an angle. And then I've got to come back over here and take care of that. But before I do, I want to clean that corner up. And of course you remember, like I said, I, the way I do my corners is I will start I don't start in the in the exact corner and the reason I don't is because if you do um, the corner really isn't clean clean so what I like to do is cut back into a corner from both sides and in doing that I can come back pick out on those corners and they're usually just clean and pristine every single time and that's the kind of that's a kind of repetitive 
thank goodness it's working this way for me. That you want on your engravings. Alright, we're going to go back around to this side. And I'm going to clean that up just a little bit. Because that line works a little... That line work is unsatisfactory as far as I'm concerned. So I'm going to go back in. And just... Clean it right up. And it's done. Alright, let's see. Got another piece right here. I'm going to go ahead and jump. Get it done. Get a jump on it. And I'm trying to kind of see what angle I want to start this at. I think what I'm going to do is uh, once I get my tube positioned. start in from this back edge. So we're going to move this up a little bit and get it over my, my center area. So as I turn, I get a smoother, even curve in my line, which is exactly what I'm looking for. Right. I need to reposition my scope so I can see where I am at. And a little bit more of a twist here. All right, so let's get started. Flip the metal out, get back in the cut. Continue your cut. You see a spot in, the, uh, in your piece where your line width varies, not a problem. Get your graver back in and go over that line, and boom, you're back to even but when you do that we're talking about a light light touch people light touch don't get in there and gouge metal out engraving is not about gouging metal out of a plate or a cylinder or the cylinder on a gun, the barrel on a, on, on a pistol. You know, it, that's not what it's about. This is about finesse. It is most definitely about finesse. All right, so we're good to go here. I've got my tube repositioned place where I want it. Again, I'm starting away from the edge, okay? I'm not going to come in. Let me see if I can find it here. Okay. Here's the piece we're cutting on, okay? I'm not going to start with my graver way back here on the very edge of this piece. I'm going to come in a little bit. The reason being is I can go back over the area that I haven't cut. That way I get a cleaner, smoother cut on these edges. I'm kind of getting to an angle that I'm not happy with. So what I'm going to do is rotate the piece a little. Not drop it. Rotate it. 
Thank you very much. Uh, and I don't like the way that line looks right there at all. So I just come back through, run my gaber through real gently, and clean that line up. Another spot, stop, rotate the piece, tighten it back down, adjust my focus, do whatever I need to so that I can see what I am doing all the time. know exactly where these two are going to meet based on the way that I've come in so I'm going to do the same thing over here I'm going to start close to the edge slow even stroke side gently and clean it up super liking it all right from where I started cutting here go back out and finish that cut roll the roll my piece come back up and get in on this corner Not corner, just that line, just to kind of get that line cleaned up and evened up. All right. Again, I'm gonna super. Okay, that line looks a ton better now. All right. So now. I'm beginning to see the detail on these lines now, and I can tell you that this piece is going to be phenomenal. Look at that blood blister. I do not have any clue where I managed to pick this little booger up, but I noticed it on my hand the other day, and I'm thinking to myself, what did I do to deserve that? A blood blister right there between your index finger and your thumb. All right. So, let me see where else I want to go next. I think what I'm going to do is just kind of continue to move up this direction. I'm going to hit that piece right there. Sometimes this fixture can be a real pain. But, you know what? Beggars can't be choosers. I'd rather have something inexpensive like this that works as far as a fixture and spend money on gravers, tools, etc. So, since we're going to be working that one piece, I'm going to, you know, naturally move it back towards the center. Yeah, I think if I did it, went in there with that half round, it would just be too much. The line would be too, too heavy. It just would not look. So. Another thing that you could do is each of it's just a simple line right along the edge, kind of like delineating the line, really making it stand out because you're going to have uh, enamel that will stay in those lines. If I made the lines wider and deeper, there would be much more enamel that would stay in the piece. But I'm afraid that that 
the half round that I have, even though, or the round bottom grave that I have is, is one of the smallest, one of the smallest ones they make, if not the smallest one, just to give you an idea. That's the graver tip right there. I think what we're looking at is too, too wide. And I think it would just, instead of accenting, it would just be too garish, stand out way too much. And the whole idea here is we want as much of the design content to blend as seamlessly as possible. All right, so back again. All right. Same drill, start away from the edge and work your way across. where my line went kind of like thick, thin, thick, thin. So now I'm going to go back in. And even up my line work as best I can. side of this line kind of move things around as I can Let's see it thin thick there. Just clean that up a tad and then come back in on the other side and start my cutting over here. For those of you watching, I'll tell you right now, if you think that you're just going to sit down and put a graver in your hand first time out and cut a line, you're not going to do it. I've had friends living here close by Louisiana who, you know, who jokingly said, oh man, that's not hard to do. Anybody can do that. So, you know, as time goes on, eventually that person's going to drop by the house to say hi. Hey, what's going on? You're going to have a beer? Let's talk. Let's watch a movie, something like that. Um, eventually, I'll lead them over here to the bench. Put a sharp engraver in the hand. With 
a uh, with a flat plate, not not a tube. And say, all right, let's see what you've got. And I will scribe for them. A straight line for them to cut. And guess what? All of a sudden they find out what they thought was so easy to do that anybody could do it. They walk away with a new appreciation for the skill. You know, in yesterday's video, I was talking about, you know, basically a total of one year of ornamental style cutting, cutting, you know, designing, which I'm doing right now. The last three years, two to three years of my jewelry career, I was working out of Baton Rouge. I was the shop foreman for a rather prestigious guild store. Now what does guild mean in terms of jewelry industry? <clears throat> guild stores are one that are highly accredited. Uh, the stores are not like Zales, Gordons, Freemans, Freedmans, and K's. These stores are not guild stores, okay? I have worked as a restyling craftsman in a number of K's and Gordons and Zales. It was my job too at one point in time. And I can most assuredly and without a doubt tell you I wouldn't buy jewelry from them. Of those three, the only one that I would consider buying anything from is K's. I don't even know that I'd call Hellsberg Jewelers a guild store, although they carry finer merchandise. Guild is more like Bailey, Banks, and Biddle. And then a lot of the really high-end mom-and-pop shops would be considered guild. I was the shop foreman for a guild store. So when... I wasn't helping the two craftsmen that worked under me with jewelry repair in the store because unlike most people think, oh, jewelers are rich. They sell diamonds. Yeah, we do. But our bread and butter is repairs. That's what keeps the doors open. That's what pays the rent.
here I'd like to take a quick look at. That leaves my corner open. So now what I'm going to do is come back and kind of give myself a point to move to on this corner. Right there. So I'm going to lean this back forward a little bit. Scoot the camera up. And we're going to start from this corner and work our way over. Oh, my cat's noisy when she drinks some water. I can hear her all the way over here. All right. Come back in. Super. All right. So we've got those two lines. Now I've got to bring them back all the way across over here. So we're going to give ourselves a twist. Remember, I'm not starting in the corner. I'm starting slightly away from the corner. And as you can see, the process just kind of keeps going on and on and on. <laughs> Just some, just some thoughts for you, and I'm going to wind this video up. I have a number of people who are vapors, people who vape instead of smoke, which I am one. Uh, very proud of the fact as well. I think the U.S. government and the Food and Drug Administration is giving vapors as a whole a very bad rap, but that's not what I want to discuss. So, I get lots of questions about, you know, what can you engrave, all right? Um, one, I don't engrave wood. I'm not a wood carver. So if you're looking for someone to carve a wooden mod for you, I'm not the person you want to talk to. Uh, two, 
can you engrave a tube that is already in my mod? No. Why? The tube is set in a mod and more often than not it's friction fit. I'm sure that there are some modders who use uh, a very minimal amount of glue to keep the tube in place. For the most part though, mods are milled on a CNC and the CNC, the tube, the opening for the tube in the wood is designed such that the tube kind of friction fits into place. Now, if I have a mod in my vise, number one, I'm already endangering the wood of the mod because I have to crank down on the vise to get it done. I won't be responsible for breaking a beautiful higher end mod, wood mod, excuse me because someone insisted that I engrave their tube while it's in the mod. That will not happen. It's not that I don't feel like I have the skill level to do so, it's that Murphy's Law happens and I don't want to get caught on the wrong side of it with somebody expecting me to pay for a mod that costs them way, way, way much money. Two, I don't engrave tubes in mods while they're in the mods because I cannot I cannot hold the tube securely while I'm cutting a line in it. And if I can't hold the tube securely, then what's going to happen is as I'm putting pressure on it this way and cutting, like to get, you know, get my, my deeper relief areas taken care of, that tube is going to twist. It's going to move, like you know, just kind of in 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 the mod. It will move. At that point, we're talking about wiring getting screwed up. We're talking about way, 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 way too many things that can go wrong. Do I engrave plastic? No, I do not. I engrave metal. So if you have a plastic mod, 3D printed plastic mod, my answer to you will be no. I'm sorry I can't help you. Now, if you have a metal door, that mod, that's a definite possibility. Brett Omen Fells out of St. Louis will soon be doing uh, anodized doors, anodized aluminum doors for the revision four billet boxes that everybody is saying is, oh, it's dead now. now it's, people who are saying it's dead don't really know as far as I'm concerned. I don't think the scene is dead where that is concerned. I think there's much more life that could be breathed into the billet box. Once those doors come out, those anodized doors, that's going to open a lot of avenues for customization. My Facebook admin uh, who takes care of the Strathclyde Engraving Group, uh, she is my muse and her, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, she comes up with some killer ideas. Her and I got talking about it. And uh, we have plans to do some work on uh, one of these 
one of these billet box doors. I think she's going to buy some of those panels. And uh, we're going to see just how far we can push the limit on those doors. Honestly, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a blast. Uh, stone setting. <laughs> Etc. I'm looking. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I'll probably end up doing some bright cut work where that's concerned. I look forward to it. It's going to be a real challenge. All right. Let's see. We've got another design piece here. I'm going to start again away from the outer edge. In other words, this edge here. to come back around from this side, uh, start away from the outside edge and work my way back towards that corner. And after this line, we're going to see where we're at. things on this Moku that will kind of catch you off guard a little bit if you're actually work, you know, doing some engraving on it. Um, you can feel the difference between the two metals, the resistance as you push through. You can feel that resistance. So, this is what's going to actually be going on for the rest of the day. I'm going to go through and finish all of these cuts. I'm moving at a pretty good rate of speed, so I should be able to get into some shading tonight. So you ask me, Paul, what is shading? How does shading work? Shading and engraving is a series of cut lines that lie right beside one another. And you vary the length of those lines to achieve what you're wanting to do. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to be swapping off of that 105 graver and going to a 90 degree. That means that the angle across the top of the V where it opens is 90 degrees. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back over to, pardon me, uh, the edge where we started. We're going to do that piece right there. So I'm going to kind of get, get that centered on my vise, and then I'm going to get that area centered on my vise. So I'm just kind of above it, looking down on it, doing my best to kind of get it where I want it. There we go. I think that will work right there. All right, so shading. This piece right here, let me roll it where I can see where it's at. I don't like the angle having to lean that over at, so let me re reposition my scope here a little bit. And I'm going to give this another quick twist. Now, how does shading work? After this, I'm going to go on ahead and close out the video and get it uploaded to YouTube. So. How am I going to do my shading? The way I normally do this, I'll give myself 
a long center line as a reference. So between these two lines, I'm going to find the center, and I'm just going to very easily push down and through. Now, I'm going to take that. That line did not go as deep as I wanted it to. So now I'm going to come back. Now what I'm doing is I'm starting with a very light touch at the beginning and then I'm leaning into it the closer I get to the end. Okay. The whole idea here is to create a line that goes from thin to thick. And you want to bring them down to, you know, approximately the same level on each one. So if you have to go back in and adjust that a little bit, go back in and adjust it a little bit. The lines on either side are going to get successively shorter. each time I come back in to cut a line. There we go. So now I'm going to come in and do the same thing on the other side. Now, to me, I guess kind of the rule of thumb that I use, I will look at my center line, and the one next to it is going to be just over three quarters, or just under three quarters of its length. Maybe just over would probably be the better word. Next one, the same thing, just over three quarters. Set your pick. Slow turn and feed. Same thing, a little over three quarters. Take it down to the same area. Remember, thick, thin to thick. So what I, what I want you to do now is, if you're watching this on on your TV or on your device on, on another device like either a laptop or a computer or something like that, you're going to hear it better on your TV because you can actually turn the volume up. But uh, headphones, you will hear it in as well. But what I want you to listen for is I want you to listen to the graver. I want you to listen at the the buzzing sound that it makes you're going to find that towards the end of the cut which is down here towards the bottom of the piece you're going to find that that graver kind of gets a little bit more aggressive with the buzzing and that's because I'm actually loading that graver up I'm actually forcing it to cut a little bit more metal so just kind of listen did you hear the difference There you go. That is how you do, that's how you do your shading. Now, again, remember all of these little lines that you come down, you know, you're, you're, you're bringing it down to a certain level. The whole idea there is I always like to leave just kind of like a little tiny, slightly tiny area of uh, untouched metal beneath it. Uh, it helps kind of brighten that spot and it also helps to accent that shading really really well now what you saw me do here with all of these multiple lines is going to be done any place where a line is actually going under another line intersecting a line anything along those lines But before I can continue to do that 
what I've got to do is actually finish up with the uh, line work on each of these pieces. So I'm going to go on ahead and do that. You've seen the last, actually, last little bit of it. So what comes after this, Paul? Well, what I've got to do is once this is done, once I have got all my shading done, and I've got my line work done on these design elements, what I'm going to do is go back over and do a final sanding. Uh, I'm not going to go as rough as 1500 grit, maybe 24 or 32 start there. And uh, what I'm going to do is smooth out any little pots of metal, pops of metal, anything along those lines that are going to create any rust spots as this goes into the mod or as it is, you know, on your hand. Now, you are going to feel some texture on the back of this, needless to say. There's nothing you can do about that. But uh, the one thing that I want to avoid is any little pieces of metal that might be sticking up that when you run your finger across it, you know, you might end up with a little cut or a little, you know, something that could snag clothing. That's something that I really, really want to try to stay away from. All right, folks. Well, I appreciate you guys coming and hanging out with me again today. Uh, this was a much shorter video. And I appreciate, you know, all the time that you guys spend watching this. Uh, I know the customer who is buying this piece is avidly watching these videos, and I'm sure he's talking about it with his friends. And I would appreciate if you guys would do the same too. Just talk about, you know, talk to him to say, hey, I know this guy does crazy engraving. He's got a YouTube channel. Why don't you go check this out? It's really, really interesting. I would appreciate if you could, you know, encourage him to su subscribe, put a like on a video that you really like, make a comment. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I thrive on constructive criticism. If you see something that you'd like to suggest as an idea, hey, suggest it. I may end up using it in a future piece. If I do, I'm going to say, hey, remember that idea that you said? Yeah. So, guys, take care. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Uh, I'll be uploading this to YouTube shortly, and uh, it will be out there for everybody to see. But until then, folks, thank you very much for stopping by the shop of Strathclyde Engraving. Paul Sinopiata signing off. Have a great day, folks.